our uh, Ed Startup 101. Uh, Ed Startup 101 live with Elliot Macy here uh, from the Macy Center in uh, Saratoga Springs, New York. We're glad to have him here. Elliot, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here, Richard. And uh, before we get into talking to Elliot, and I'll, I'll give a brief intro to him and mostly let him take some time, uh, David, do you want to just give a quick uh, update on some of the great things we're seeing from the ideas that have been coming in this week on the, on the posts? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's been really fun reading what folks have been writing about their ideas. Uh, and uh, as we've moved into this first week of the pain test, people are starting to, to work into that part as well, trying to describe the, the pain that they think people are feeling or relative to their idea. Uh, I, I think one of the thing that's, things that's been most exciting on the idea side is we've asked you to talk about why you're interested in solving a particular idea is um, listening to people talk about problems that they've experienced firsthand, where they were a teacher in a school for five years, or they worked in this context for seven years, and they had this problem all the time. And um, seeing people really pick up things that they're passionate about, that they have a fairly deep understanding of, because it's a pain that they've felt personally. Uh, I, I tweeted a day or two ago this famous quote by Eric Raymond, who's kind of the godfather of open source software, that every good piece of software starts with a developer scratching his own itch. And uh, I, I think that's true on the business side as well. I think the people that make the best solutions to problems are the people that understand them the most deeply. And, and that kind of leads us into this new topic uh, for this week and for next week, which is looking at pain. Um, and I just wanted to say a, a quick word about the pain test here and, uh, and to try to keep everybody focused and keep us all going the same way. And that is just to say that a lot of this course is about validating your assumptions. You assume that people in the world have a particular kind of problem. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. You assume that a particular kind of solution will actually solve the problem. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. And too many businesses are built on these assumptions that go unvalidated until there's been six months or a year spent and money spent, and it turns out that nobody needs the thing that you actually built. So this two weeks that we've set aside for the pain test is really to give you plenty of time to understand what you think the problem you're trying to solve is and then to get out in front of as many people as physically possible that you think are actually feeling that pain and ask them these questions uh, that you'll see on the page about the pain test um, and just find out whether they actually have that problem that you're trying to solve with, with what you're trying to start or not. And we'd encourage you really not to think about this as I need to talk to five people or I need to talk to ten people, but keep talking to people until you're hearing the same answers over and over again. If you're talking to 20 people and still hearing something new every time, keep talking to people uh, until you've kind of heard everything and that you're starting to hear the same answers coming back again. And then you'll have a sense of uh, really understanding what the pain is or isn't. And then the last piece of advice I want to give as you're moving into this next week is approach these conversations with people on the assumption that you're wrong about the pain. If you, if you come into the conversation with the idea that you're, in, you're kind of in the right ballpark, but you need their help to really figure out exactly where the pain is, you'll have a different set of conversations. And if you come in with the assumption that you've got it right and you need to defend your, con your concept of the pain against their answers that maybe don't agree with it, you know, talk to people and use them to really learn what is needed so you can build something that will bless people's lives and actually be, be helpful. So with that little bit of advice and just saying it's been great reading what you're writing and I know Richard's left some comments and I've left some comments. There's so many of you we can't leave comments on everything that everybody's writing but also seeing that you're commenting on each other's work and encouraging each other and kind of sharing ideas and whatnot. That is great. Please keep that up. Uh, we'll keep reading and, and leaving comments as we can as well. But uh, press on uh, into this next week w with the pain test. Excited to see what you're doing and pass it back to Richard. Thanks. Great, Excellent. thank you. And David, a uh, nice, uh, nice office that you're coming to us from today. I, I think that's a great up, up, upgrade for you there, buddy. It, it, it's my startup space. That's right. You just need <laughs> a couple of ramen and you're good to go. So um, thanks, everybody. And for those of you who are joining us, I know uh, we have a, a number of people who have actually just joined in uh, this last week and are, and are, are uh, jumping on. So if you have not participated in a live session before, remember that uh, we will be in just a little bit uh, opening up questions for, uh, for Elliot. And so in order to ask questions or respond, we'll be monitoring the uh, Twitter feed on the Ed Startup hashtag. And so any questions that you have, post them there. If you posted questions on the uh, site, on the edstartup.net site ahead of time, I have those and we'll be asking. But any questions that you want to ask now, just use the hashtag edstartup. Uh, with that, let me uh, uh, 
intro, very quickly introduce Elliot because I've actually asked him to take the first few minutes to tell a little bit about his story. So I, I won't want to uh, uh, take away from that at all. Um, but I do just want to quickly say uh, that uh, that I'm really glad to have Elliot here. Elliot leads the uh, uh, Macy Center uh, and also uh, heads up the uh, Learning uh, 2012 conference that is coming up in uh, just a little bit. So uh, those of you who uh, aren't aware of that uh, should put that on your radar as well. Um, and in addition, uh, Elliot is a, a, a thought leader and really has been very helpful. And I just want to share, uh, Elliot, I hope it's okay with you, a, a bit of a, a, a personal uh, experience. And, and I, I'm not sure you even know this, quite frankly. But oh. a, num a, a, a number of years ago, um, I was looking for some advice on how I could make the most impact in this field, what I could do to bring my unique talents. And um, I had just met Elliot not that long before and, and called him and he was running to catch a train to New York and was talking to me on the way and he said, this is the time I have, you fit me in and uh, gave me some advice and I was scribbling notes on little post-it notes is all I had at the time. And uh, his advice actually ended up being some of the most valuable advice I've ever received. And Elliot, to this day, this is my wallet right here, I still carry these post-it <laughs> notes around right here with the notes from our conversation from all those years ago. Mm -hmm. And so as we were uh, thinking, as David and I were thinking about who were the people that we wanted to bring in, uh, we thought about who were the people that really gave us the best advice and were the most meaningful in our careers along the way. And, uh, and Elliot certainly uh, has been that case for me, and so I wanted to, to have him join in. So thank you, Elliot. Thanks for being here, and uh, really looking forward to what you have to, to share, and especially since you're going to give us a viewpoint that really is distinct from anything we've heard yet, which is focusing specifically on adult learning and workplace learning and sort of the issues and, and, and challenges and opportunities there. So with that, let me stop talking and turn it over to you and say thanks for being here and, and happy, to, happy to hear from you again. Well, it's, uh, it's an honor, and uh, Richard and I have uh, known each other in a variety of different hats on, and uh, I think that's actually one of the largest um, pieces of advice. I also am a serial entrepreneur, um, and uh, over the years have built and sold probably four different companies. Uh, I think you have to really, uh, you know, we always talk about these instant connections, and I'm right with you. You have to go out and you have to talk and, and ask and listen to some really important questions. I also think you have to look at the maturation of relationships. In other words, uh, for all you know, your, your fourth grade teacher would be a really per good person to reconnect with or that, uh, that person you've known for, for many, many years. Because I think over time there's a trust that builds up and you get some amazing advice from your, your, your trusted circle of, of, of folks. Uh, I spend my life in a very interesting niche. And it's a niche that's been important to me uh, literally since about the age of 20. Uh, I am at the wonderful age of 62. I call myself an alpha boomer. Um, and we are the scourge of people my wife's age who are one generation below because we're not leaving. You know, <laughs> we're not leaving. We're, we're there and we're going to stay there. Uh, we're, we're probably not leaving our jobs. We're, we're not leaving the world of work. Uh, and, um, and so I've had 40 years in this field. And since the very beginning, I've been focused on one thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful thing to know early on. And that one thing is the opportunity for us to leverage the affordances of technology. Not the technology, but what it affords us the ability to do. To help people learn to do their jobs better or to learn to do their next job. So I have been this boutique micro-specialist all my life. Now, I will share, when I started it, nobody in the world was interested in that. So I was a very alone specialist. But over the years, did a number of things. I helped set up Novell, Microsoft, IBM's uh, um, authorized training centers. When PCs came out, we had to teach people how to use them. And so there was one connection. Uh, I set up some conferences. Uh, I, um, I get blamed or credited with helping to popularize in the workforce learning world the phrase e-learning. Now, I think nobody invented it. I think it was a sort of a spontaneous combustion in a lot of places. But I did help to sort of popularize that and probably regret the phrase ever since because uh, everybody thinks the E in e-learning stands for electronic. And I was in the uh, chairman of the board's office of IBM, and we talked about the E being everywhere, everyone, every day, efficient, effective. And electronic was, was just the method. But, but
but but the like. Um, and then, sort of in the 1994-95 era, I, I, I rotated my interest to really ask the question, how do we use technology from the collaborative technology we can now do easy versus the old video conference day where it would be like that, um, to um, a whole set of, of, of small and large tools to look at this concept of workplace learning. And where we work, and, and Richard mentioned my, uh, my learning consortium, so I was on the phone yesterday with a good buddy who heads up learning for Walmart. And they have this little challenge of uh, 1.5 million people every year start at Walmart. And then today I'll be on the phone with McDonald's in a few moments, and McDonald's has a similar turnover. But it's at the higher end as well, whether it be our colleagues at Google who are providing this platform, or, uh, or Emirates Airlines that's trying to teach flight attendants to fly these incredible, wonderful planes and speak 21 different languages for 81 different nationalities. So whether learning is something small or big, whether it is formally provided face-to-face -face or organized by learners, uh, that's our passion. Now, when, when Richard asked me to join here, I was trying to figure out a few things I could start with, but obviously we want to make this fairly interactive. So I, I'm going to share a few views because I actually think we've siloed the world of learning and uh, from both an investment point of view, from a product point of view, and even from, I think, a self-orientation point of view. So what are the fields of learning? Well, there's K through 12. Um, there is higher education. Um, there is workplace learning. And then there are all these other things, you know, for instance, uh, religious education, huge. In fact, probably the largest step forwards in the area of e-learning were done by a whole range of religions from, uh, you know, from LDS to the Jews to uh, friends of mine who, are, who are, operate within India to, to use, use learning via technology. Um, and then in, on top of that, we now have this other area of learning, which is not really goal-focused by my role in life, but what I'm just passionate about, you know? So you might happen to be a Baltimore baseball fan. So, you know, you might want to become learning focused on, on that hobby, that interest. And one of the groups we're giving a prize to at our conference in three weeks is uh, MD Anderson. It's a cancer center, and their goal is making cancer history. But literally, God forbid, one of your family members hears that they have cancer today. They will go, and you will, as their family member, go into this intense learning cycle. Literally within 24 hours, you will join two communities. You'll go to 18 sites. You'll get some good information. You'll probably get some real dangerous information. You'll forget most of what you got in the, uh, in the hospital is information, and you'll build your own construct. So this is where, for me, we got to blow up the silos because bluntly what we use for our health area, what we use K-12, what we use in, at workplace, I think some real similar learning needs and requirements. Now, what are some things I think we need to think about? Number one, and I, I shared a little conversation with my colleagues here before we came on, um, I often get people who call up and say, I'm, I'm investing money in this, what should I do? And sometimes they're really large groups. I now sit on a board with Eric Schmidt from Google, and, uh, you know, and they think of learning in those really large terms, and sometimes it's somebody who has an idea for this micro product, and both are good. But I think if you're looking at our space, if part of what you want to do is whatever you build, if it's aimed at K-12, higher ed, or alike, you shouldn't exclude the other silos. But if you look at our space, one of the things you need to be thinking about is creating solutions to, as you said before, real problems, but not to overpackage them. Um, I will tell you, I get to see lots and lots of startup and, and, and there, there, are these, um, there are these syndromes that happen. You know, you start with um, what Pablo Freire used to call a, a simple problem to a simple solution, like a Band-Aid on, you know, on, on an insect bite, and pretty soon you're building an antiseptic environment to, to treat it. Uh, some of what we are looking for are these really simple solutions. Uh, I'll give you an example. So we're here right now, and I'm on a, I'm on a webcam. Okay, so I went out to say, you know, the light's not that good. 
went on a webcam. Could I get a light for that? And I literally went to 15 of the largest photography stores to look for, is there a webcam that has a light that lights me? Now, I happen to have good lighting here. Um, couldn't find one. You know, I finally found this. I'll blind you for a second, okay? But, you know, this is really sort of an interesting one, so I can put it there. Oh, that doesn't, that, now you get to see bright Elliot over, over there. Uh, you know, um, but it was really interesting because the guy was trying to sell me a $14,000 lighting system, you know. And what I really wanted was a piece of hardware that I could mount. And by the way, this is too big, too bright, and will probably reduce the IQ of each person using it. But very often we come up with these macro solutions. So I talked to somebody about real simple need. Could we come up with a way that when people walk into your classroom with 18 different digital devices, that we could rapidly link them all together, irrespective of a platform, not requiring any download, just link them together? Because that would be helpful for everybody on here. We've been at meetings and we want to have a, a safe temporary space. And he was starting to write something. I thought that was really interesting. I even put some money in, in Kickstarter. You know, I figure I'll, I'll tease him a little bit, get him pretty involved. Well, before we got done, he sent me, now it was going to the corporate education model. My thought this would be free or $1.99, you know? Well, I kind of got a proposal, which is going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars for a company to redo end-to-end -end all content and change the way in which digital publications are forever, you know? Crapola, you know, but that's not, that's not how we succeed. The way we succeed is we look at, I actually believe, small problems and come up with elegant small solutions. Now, if they work well, they may lead to many others, but I actually think, you know, I'm looking for a small solution for getting light as we use more webinar elements um, and use cameras in that sense. The second thing I think we need to do is don't think that everything you come up with is about changing the world. You know, because the reality is there's some things that are really simple. You know, post-it notes. That I, I use post-it notes too. I mean, I, I keep some of them. And very often what I'm now seeing in the educational innovation space, when this happens, learning as we know it is now going to be different. You know, and so you're at the spear of changing everything. The reality is most of the people in my space aren't trying to change everything. They're trying to get people hired to do today's job today or tomorrow's job tomorrow. Now, if you can give them something that accelerates that, evolves that, does it differently, way powerful. But you don't want the tool to be wrapped in a revolutionary mode. If it's revolution, it will happen. It will happen. I mean, Google is about an algorithm of search. Now think about how it's changed, but they wouldn't dare walking around initially saying, everybody's going to stop writing websites, they're going to go to Google in that process. So I would actually pull out some of the language fabric that when you use your new product, everything will change. Because the moment you do it, you put me into a reactionary mode as a buyer. The final thing I would do, and then Richard, why don't you start up on this, is uh, get a little bit of humor humor. You know, um, people in the venture, I'm now on, I think, six boards. And, you know, one of the, I used to want to always interview the audit committee and I wanted to see who was doing before I joined the board. Now I give them like the laugh test. Like, are these people who actually, when they get together, laugh? Do they want to approach something that's fun? And one of our things is very, very serious. Rita Colwell, uh, you've met her. I'm on her board for something that will discover if a substance is anthrax. But we laugh a lot at that board. And I think we've got to figure out how to bring humor into that. You know, like, for instance, I keep, I keep a big piece of sushi around here, you know. Now, it's very, you know, when I'm having a meeting, I bounce my, I bounce my sushi around. It's, it's weird, but, but it suddenly changes this from this hyper-serious solution to everything to understand. Like, I love how you reframed your house with the, the stuff that looks like it's siding on that to be building, you know. Even that's a product. Like, how do we look like we're under construction when we're not with, with special wallpaper? I'm on the, uh, my, my final interest these days is that I'm a theater producer in addition to what I do in the learning space. And uh, I was really excited. My most recent piece of uh, 
piece of theater is actually opening tonight in San Diego called Allegiance, and it's starring Leia Salanga from Miss Saigon, but most importantly, George Takei from Star Trek, you know, you know, our, 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 our airborne guy. And, and I've gotten to know George. And what George would say is when you're going to talk about something really serious, laugh. Because if you're not adding humor to it, you're probably not connecting to the emotional component. And even something serious like an ERP cloud babe emulation with verification and the like has a little bit of emotion and seriousness and, and humor to it. And I will tell you, an awful lot of people take themselves too seriously, think they're the Benjamin Franklin of everything, and don't along the way understand that we're really looking for some pretty simple solutions to simple problems and that in that process you move everyone's needle forward. So I'm going to pause. We can go in lots of directions. Richard, I know you're not shy about inquiring and, and, and maybe a few people have posted some notes along the way. So, Elliot, thank you very much. Um, yes, there already are uh, quite a few uh, questions and I think, uh, I think you're, this, this idea of not over packaging or over designing a solution I think is helpful and actually ties into some of them here. One though that I'd like to uh, throw at you came from Sean and uh, this relates to, to, to you, I mean you consider yourself a, a futurist in, in this space and Sean's question is how is being a futurist in the learning space different than other domains and mm -hmm. what are particular factors that you look for or analyze as you're trying to look at what the future will be? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I guess I've typed the word futurist in a few times, and sometimes people use words. I'll give, I mean, I'll be blunt. We're amongst colleagues here. The one that I hate, I've never used for myself, I'm called the guru, you know. Now, this to me drives me ape crap, you know, and it threatens my marriage. My wife does not want to be married to a guru. But literally people will say, I'm calling up to talk to Elliot, the guru. You know, um, now what that becomes is it's a it's it's an ascribed thing, and I think the reason I'm a guru is I sell no product, which is probably what gurus generally do. They they have no products to sell. Uh, but what I've done in a futurist model is I view that I'm an analyst, but not a buy side analyst. I have no interest in describing which is the best or the worst LMS. What I try to do as an analyst, and it's funny because to be a futurist, you have to be a historian. You have to connect the past to the present to the future, is I'm continually asking the question, given the things we are doing now or are out now, how do we connect to, the, what's, what's logical about the future? What are the economic and marketplace vectors? So let me give you an interesting example. This is a perfect one that we're doing. Because I was just talking to somebody about 15 minutes ago. We want to have a video collaboration. Right now, we're still having it in a dedicated platform. So we're now in Google Hangout, okay? That was true in the early days of email. If we wanted to be on email, we had to be on Profs or on Vax. And then we went to x.25 where your email address was 138 characters long. But now we can, be, we can have an email and it's irrelevant what, what system we're using, but we're just connecting. When will we get to that for video connection? When will we get to that for, for Hangout? So I'm very intrigued with what the vector is going to be to moving away from the designated place we collaborate, whether it be Twitter or Yammer or Bloomberg or whatever, to once I know who you are, we can contractually connect irrespective of platform and do that in, in ways. So my role as a futurist is to sort of look at that and then I do exactly what you talked about before they should do. I go talk to people. I call chief learning officers, CEOs. God forbid you sit next to me on an airplane. You will be interrogated whether you're 9 or 90. Uh, and, and so I, that's what I do. The other piece that I try to look at is this word affordance. And, and if, I were, if, I, if I could write on the screen, I would put the word affordance then. Because what I think the affordance model does, and it's really an interesting one, you know, all this is is uh, an iPhone. But when does it become an affordance? So here's an affordance. My eyes are really good, but you know what? At 62, they're not as dark. They, they don't handle dark as well. So one of the best affordances that this has is last night it was a flashlight when I was at this very dark restaurant to, uh, to look at it. It created for me the, the, the affordances, what does the technology allow me to do better that I couldn't do without the technology? 
And in that instance, I lit up a space. And by the way, I lent it, this time for no fee, to three other people I was eating with. Next time there'll be a, a mile fee. And I actually have a square thing so I could charge a dollar for, for the use of my flashlight. But, um, but I look continually at the concept of affordances. And it's tough because bluntly, most suppliers, most vendors, and most tech people overstate and get wrong the affordances. Google never thought that what they were building was a search engine. They really thought they were constructing this hyper, this hyper text graphical model index and, and the like. So the affordances may not be relevant, may not be obvious day one. But as a futurist, what I'm generally doing is talking to other people about, hey, how might you use that? What might be that, that element of, of, of affordance? And our biggest mistake, once again, is that the answer lies in a single generation, a single cohort. Because, yes, I want to talk to that youngest millennial. But, you know, look at George Takei. He's 76 years old. He has 2.5 million likes on Facebook. You know, and when he does, he tweeted out something about me, and suddenly I ended up with you know 800 new followers. You know, a 70 years, a 76 year old person. So don't think that the answer lies in a dedicated, isolated, predictable cohort. In that sense, Elliot, right, thank you. And I think uh, just one one uh, piece that I thought was interesting. I was talking to a, a mutual friend, Judy Brown, the other day, who does a lot with mobile learning. And, uh, and somebody came up to her and said, "Oh, you have the you know whatever phone was that she had. It was a new version of a you know a smartphone." And I thought her answer was phenomenal. She said, "No, no, it's not a phone. It's a personal computer that does all kinds of things for me all day. It just happens to have a phone app on it." Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, <laughs> I love uh, it. I love it. Good, yeah. good, good way to think about the affordances. So. Um, there are some questions here, and so let me let me ask you one about uh, specifically in the, in the uh, uh, workplace learning space. Um, one of the there there are some movements that we're seeing in uh, in higher ed and some other places around uh, maker spaces, do it yourself, sort of rapid development kind of things. Um, are any of those movements taking hold in corporate learning? And if not, is there anything that can be done to help accelerate that at all? Well, I do have uh, one uh, 3D printer uh, next door and another one coming, I guess, on Friday. I, I was a Kickstarter investor for a new cool 3D, 3D, 3D printer. Um, but no, for the most part, they're not. Um, one of the realities around those areas is a culture of cross-organizational cooperation, which doesn't require a lawyer to bless it. Um, and so what we have in the corporate sector is an intellectual desire to do that. But the reality of doing that becomes enormous. I mean, <laughs> you even know that, Richard. You know, we were talking about doing an infographic, and, and, and we got to figure out whose intellectual property rights, how do we ascertain that. And so there are complexity layers that have slowed that down a bit. Now, I think we're building those spaces. Uh, one of the people who's at my conferences here is Diana Oblinger from uh, EduCause, from the higher ed space. And we're actually seeing how do we build a better link between the higher ed and the, the workplace learning space. Uh, even in the area of open space, of open learning, whether that may not be as much a MOOC, but, but uh, you know, I could point to probably 95 companies that all have the exact same learning challenge around, let's say, a new financial regulation. Um, why not get them together and build something really cool? We kind of have that, but it operates through a financial model of a vendor who syndicates that. Why not just get them together? Well, each time we brought them together, there have been layers of legal complexity that have made that more difficult. Now, where I think it's coming, to be really honest with you, is a. Um, I think we're going to start to see and I think some of the people on the phone may be part of this, um, ways in which our digital environment, our larger digital environment, can um, take content in a way that it's easily repurposed. You know? So I talk regularly to my colleagues at Adobe and at YouTube and, and the like. You know? So how do I take, let's say, Richard, a YouTube of you, and then how do I bring it down in a reconstructable fashion and, and, and find second, third generations, and then perhaps post it. So we're, we're going to be slower arrivers institutionally. Now, the thing you have to understand, 
is if you go up to a thousand workers in a thousand companies and ask them how they did their how did they learn to do their jobs, none of them will point to the learning assets provided by their corporation. Mm -hmm. Almost inevitably, they all talk the way Richard did. Well, I met somebody, I talked to somebody, I watched somebody, I read something, I went online. I went to a colleague at another firm who I went to college with, and he taught me how to do that. So some of that maker bot, some maker maker community, open community, is actually going to happen more rapidly at the learner level than as the, the than at the worker as as a formal learner level. Um, and I also think that we are starting to see a much more creative relationship between multiple institutions. And then once again, that would be organizations. I certainly know the Department of Education. I've worked with them on relationships to higher ed. To uh, that, I mean, I took the robotics course, one of the first MOOCs, and uh, there were all these subsections. And I got into sort of a corporate geek subsection, you know. And and we were we were we had a very uniquely different conversation. Than the college students did on that because we kept we kept trying to apply it to, to a workplace environment. So, um, and by the way, before I ask you ask you the next question, I, there's a great tweet that just came through that somebody says, "I hope to never be a former learner." I thought that was a great uh, <laughs> a great statement. So, thanks for adding that. But I, I wanted to follow up on, on something, and this actually does tie into some of the the posts that have been here as well. You talk about the the value of these partnerships that are kind of developing across different organizations as as sort of a, you know networks and strengths get built out. I wonder, as there's this this need for uh, retooling and, and and retraining in the workplace, um, what is the role of higher ed institutions? We have a number of people participating that are on live and also participating in the course that represent higher ed institutions. Is there a role that they have in serving that market? Yeah. If so, are they doing it? If not, do you have recommendations for them? Oh, I'm going to give away one of the things I was going to talk to you about on the on the, Richard's one of our keynoters at our, our conference. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about stackable credentials, that sort of a higher ed phrase. Uh, in my world, they're interested in merit badges. Um, I don't know if you've been a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, but there's an enormous interest in merit badging. You know, um, I mean, I got, believe it or not, at the age, I, I, at the age of, of seven, 1957, I got the radiation merit badge from the Boy Scouts for having gone to Brookhaven National Lab and manipulated some arms and the like. And I keep trying to get jobs based on that, and nobody will, write, and my mother lost the badge, so there's no, there's no LMS for Boy Scouts, so I can demonstrate it. But, um, but I do think we're going to see this desire for merit badging. Meaning, so let's take that. Let's take a different kind of a person. Because I'm very fortunate. I've been successful. I'll never. I'll always work. But I don't have to work. Okay. But there are a lot of people who are retiring who can't afford not to work. You know, and they're going back, and they, they might not be able to afford it economically. A huge space, um, and it's going to be difficult because the you know the ed world thinks about and certifications. Mm -hmm. And actually in the in the workforce world, we don't give a crap about end certifications. You know, a good example, you enter a gaming and animation program, and if you graduate in that program, you probably aren't that successful. Because if you're good, you will be hired during those four years. So in some ways the person who makes it through a, a linear four years may have a little bit of a of a hiring defect at that point. Um, you know, so I actually think we need to shift in the workplace towards whether we call them merit badges or whatever. But I want to get a badge. I want to get a badge about you know time management, or I want to get a badge around um, you know money laundering, compliance, and banking, or or any of those other elements. Uh, and there's a huge role, a for higher ed. B, there's a huge role for this wave, this wave. I'm on the board of Skidmore College as a trustee. There is a wave, hundreds of thousands of faculty who are retired or retiring and who aren't ending. How do we use them affiliated through some institution as mentors, as, as certifiers, as, as, as a lot? So I actually think there's a huge relationship. We've got to reproductize it, though, because of... Um, that that many of those folks don't want another degree but you know like i go to the library not to take out a book but i go to the library because there's a lot of knowledge there and sometimes i take out a book so we've got to think of higher ed in that same way it is an, a wonderful institution of knowledge and i will access it in a variety of ways and sometimes i'll get a degree but i might also sometimes get a certification get an experiment or even 
be able to walk in. I mean, be, I always thought it'd be great to. I was talking to some leaders at Starbucks to have an hour a day where people would rip apart your PowerPoint presentation at Starbucks. You know, where you could bring one in and some random people would critique it for you. You know, but we have this interesting need, particularly as we're distributed in the workforce, to sometimes get in your face comments and reactions. So. Uh, there's an idea. Set up a you know set up a a, a rip apart uh, meetup uh, process at Starbucks. So love it. No, noted. Noted. So okay. So on that, since you've since you've already bridged the gap into some questions that we're we're typically getting uh, here. And by the way, we typically ask everybody this this question too. But but uh, but you're already moving in here. We have a whole bunch of people here who are coming up with ideas. They're going through this process, of doing the pain test. They're trying to think about what they would do. What are some specific uh, products or services that you would like to see if you had your wish list? You already hinted at some with badges, but uh, you can yeah. talk about badges or go into others as well. What, what would be on the wish list for Elliot Macy? I think there are a couple of things. Um, I really believe we need the equivalent of visualization of an individual's knowledge set and learning requirements. Um, so I get, so I could go see, you know, I can look at my contacts visually, but I really can't see my knowledge against aspiration visually. You know, um, and I'd like to have it in a way that it then not only is a sort of self motivator for me, but it 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 becomes actionable. You know, in the sense, uh, I think we're going to need to figure out how do we. I'll give you one area that I think is really potent. The ebook is a technology without an affordance other than portability. Now, you know, so the ebook works because it's now not printed, but we are still mirroring the old book when we do it. So George Takei came out with a new ebook called, you know, you know, oh my, I think it has eight Ys in it, you know. And I had a long conversation with him about is it one ebook or will it be many ebooks? And he got really interested in what many ebooks might look like. You know, in other words, not everybody necessarily gets the same one. But how does the ebook evolve to where it actually in many ways becomes the home of a of a set of curated content, collaboration, certification, social connection, uh, other elements, performance support built into it. I think there's another area which is a, which is an interesting one. In and I get this more as I travel overseas than I than I do in the United States, which is the ability to be rigorously uh, assessed, rigorously assessed. One of our problems is most assessment in workplace learning is pretty lame. Um, you know, 98% pass in e-learning. And I would say even in a lot of higher ed, it's, it's modestly lame, you know, uh, particularly in the business departments. But, but we could take three hours on that. Uh, um, but how do you really get hard assessment? You know, if I were learning to golf, I would get really hard assessment along the way. And what are what are the ways? And because I think you know, Paul G is wonderful in talking about that we learn, but we learn through failure. And I actually think we're building failure. I think with helicopter parents and other things, we're building failure resistant environments. Yeah. But if I want to get to another level of mastery, I need some. I need some failure. I think there's going to be an enormous um, reality of how do I manage people who are distributed. Uh, so I'm a manager, and I've got people in multiple sites. How do I manage them? You know, uh, how do I touch them? Um, how do I connect with them? You know, Bob, who who you know and was a, a colleague at the CIA, mm -hmm. Bob works for me as my chief learning officer, and we regularly bring bring him digitally into lunch because we want him to have the lunch conversation as well as the structured one. The other piece that I think is going to be interesting is the globalization of learning which is how do we actually learn across cultures? We just set up an office in China, and um, it's fascinating when you've got a team with somebody in China, somebody in India, somebody in Brazil, somebody in Salt Lake City, somebody in New York. How do they learn together? And, how, and that includes both language in our, our, our language language, but also there's language in terms of compliance or non-compliance. So I think that's a huge opportunity. And finally, um, I think we are beginning to see, and I don't think you'll get it to market this year, but I think the neuroscience of learning is going to be a really interesting element of that. One of my good friends is John Abley, who is the founder of Boston Scientific. And we've been talking a lot about electroencephalographs and other elements of where 
I kind of look at what's going on physiologically and cognitively as I'm learning, you know, and I'm not saying take this pill and you'll learn, but, um, but, but we aren't yet there. We still have a black box model, you know, present good content and good learning will come out of it. And I really think if we can start to get at that, that you and I are different, Richard. We like each other, but we're different. But, you know, like for instance, my wife and I are very different. You hand me something new and I will attempt to break it within 10 minutes because I learn by breaking it. My wife studies it, preys on it, honors it, uh, you know, watches somebody else do it, and her goal is to never break it. Now, we both end up at competency at the same moment, but two totally divergent highways in that process. And once again, how do we either self-identify and slice learning uh, appropriately there? Great, great ideas. Thanks, Elliot. And uh, uh, what I'd like to do actually now, if it's all right, is, is give uh, David and Aaron a, a chance to join in the conversation as well. So, David, why don't you uh, start first? Any Anything you'd like to uh, add and, and ask Elliot? Yeah, so I, I guess the question that I would ask Elliot is, you know, as you've talked today, it's become clear that you're uh, really quite well networked. Um, and that there's a lot of people you know, and you're involved in a lot of interesting things, and that's uh, the, the kind of thing that's a little bit like lint in the dryer trap. That it, it, mm -hmm. it's hard mm -hmm. to get started, but once you're there, it's easy to pick up, and it goes faster and faster, and kind of snowballs. What would you say for folks uh, in, in the class who are trying to break into this space, who are trying to figure out how to make those first uh, social connections as networkers, so that they start to meet people, so they get invited to conferences, or yep. they get you know, invited to serve on boards or, or make those connections that help them keep track of what's going on and what's interesting and, and make easier progress. Let me give you a modestly self-serving answer. Uh, I happen to serve on the board of FIRST Robotics, started by my friend Dean Kamen, who invented the Segway, and we do, we do robotic competitions all around the world, and, you know, and Eric Schmidt's on the board with us there. Uh, start by being a volunteer. I, I think some of the best ways in which you meet some of your most influential connections is volunteering at a service level in an area that you're passionate about. You know, uh, way back when I was a young pup, I went to the Boston, the Boston Computer Club, you know, and, you know, and met a guy named Ray Ozzy who went out and wrote Lotus Notes and stuff. You know, so some of those connections occur not when we're commercially transacting, but when we're doing something in common. So I think that's one place. The second place, and I think it's an interesting one for those of you that are technical, is um, look at ways in which you can become part of uh, if other people's, if you will, think tanks. Um, you know, and so I think what you're, we're doing here is really powerful and positive. But you know, affiliate with a business school and become part of a group that does entrepreneurial reacting or mentoring. You know. And part of the reason is to meet the other people who are mentors. So the first time I met one of my good friends now, Dennis Donnerman, who is a CFO of and vice chair of General Electric. He and I were co-judges at a, a college business presentation. And we, we bonded by requiring the students to shut off the PowerPoint, sit down, and without notes, explain to us what their business were. And as sweat was pouring from them, Dennis and I got to be friends, and we're friends years later. So I think those are some of the elements. Um, the, the other piece, which I think is a really interesting one, is to, and I said it before, go back in your past. Everybody tries to weave new. But if we really do a, a, a true extended social network of the people we've known, you know, your professors at college, some of them you haven't talked to in 30 years, 10 years, or, or one year, they were really connected. You know, I, 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 every now and then I, I get a smile. Somebody tells me they're taking a course with someone, and while they're talking, I go look up the dissertation of that person who was their faculty member. And I said, did you ever talk to him about penguins in Antarctica? Well, why? Well, do you know he's the world's leading expert on penguins? But I took him for a course on geography. Well, you never look to see what he really knew. And so I think in our past are the no's to go, you know, click along the, uh, along the way. So, so to restate then, you're talking about serving and volunteering, right? Doing, doing service and, and becoming part of those networks that way before you have the credentials to be there be there because you're willing to be free labor and to, to serve yeah. and volunteer and work. But then 
Also, I think a, a key point that you're pulling out here is talk to people about things other than the thing you think you're supposed to be talking to them about, right? Because it turns right. out they're experts on penguins, or they know somebody that you know, or they know that there's something coming up that they need volunteers for. Or something. Yeah, and, the, and, those yeah. social conversations that seem like they're off-topic really never turn out to be off-topic, right? Yeah. And, and, and this may be, this may, I, don't, I hope I don't bump into something you've shared with them in a different way, or it may be anathema, but you know, I sometimes think people who are doing startups become um, startup weasels. You know, like they're, like, like, like they're, you know, they're. You kind of want to run out of the garden when they're there, because they're, you know, you know, they're one step away from giving you their PowerPoint, or you know, they're weaseling. And sometimes you connect with somebody on something that you're both passionate about that neither of you has an economic interest in. Now, someday they may, so I met Dean in a totally different environment, and one day the phone rang. He said, this is Dean Kamen, do you know me? I said, oh, we met once. He said, well, you know, I'm doing this segue, I hope people don't fall off. Uh, you do usability, uh, I want to fly one over to you and have you look at it, you know. And, uh, and I did something really interesting. I said, sure. He said, what are you going to charge me? I said, nothing. It'd be fun to work with you, Dean. And out of that came a 10-year relationship. But in other words, don't make every interaction a financial weaselly one. You know, <laughs> Connect with people authentically. Because what we all have in common that are involved with this is we are project people. We probably all were in the science fair in high school. We probably love playing with new crap. You know. Connect at that level with people before you try to think about Series B engagement of them. You know, um. hey, Elliot, any advice? J jumping on that that point about uh, how you find and pick a good mentor. That's advice I've heard you say before. So, in addition to the general networking you do, how do you choose those people, and how do you approach somebody and say, "Hey, will you be my mentor?" Or how does that work? Several things. I think your mentor has to be fundamentally different than you. Okay, I'm a New York City Jewish kid. I don't know if I have any Jewish mentors. Okay, I have a couple good Mormon mentors. I've got a Hindu mentor. I've got you know my wife gives me Catholic mentors. You know, unlimited feed there. Uh, I go for gender differences. I actually think as men and women we are from slightly different planets, and I think it's very powerful to get. I look at generational. I have a mentor now who is 19 years old, is a sophomore from Dubai studying in Brown. And she's one of my mentors right now. Not the other way around. She's my mentor. So I think there's generational elements. And then I think you have to find mentors who listen. Uh, the, the world is filled with people who will uh, give you meant crap. You know, like they'll just, they'll, they'll, they'll give you the same crap over and over again. To me, a really good mentor asks really good questions, maybe even writes a note or two, uh, thinks about it, even says, you know, let me think about that. I, I want to talk about that. The mentor who's starting to answer you before you've even finished asking the question is probably just a vending machine mentor, you know, and you actually want something that's custom built for you because really what you want is not the answer. I mean, I don't know what I wrote on what you wrote on that paper. Richard, but the real element was the relationship that got built in, mm -hmm. in there. And that requires listening, respect, and also the ability to tell you, I mean, you came to me with one thing and I said, I don't think you should do that. Try this. And, you know, that you really do want a mentor who's not just going to tell you what everybody else, uh, what everybody else will, uh, will, will tell you. And, I mean, I have a friend who's running for a political office and is not going to win. And yesterday he was in my office, and I talked to him about how he resigned easily. To, to you know, it was a it was a very tough conversation. And he's 64, 65. And at the end of the conversation, there were tears in his eye, and he gave me a hug. He said nobody was willing to ever say that to me, you know. And uh, but I think mentors cross that line to be able to take personal and professional risks with you as well. Thanks, Elliot. Um, Aaron, I didn't mean to jump in there again. I'm going to hand it over to you before we have to wrap up in just a few minutes. Yeah, well, I just um, I, I love the way you talked about startup weasels. I, I've I've seen a lot of them too. Um, it, it made me think actually of uh, crusaders. That's a really common. That's another common mm -hmm. trait you see, especially with people that have a socially motivated startup, like an education. 
what advice do you have for the people that want to be the crusaders, the ones who want to go out and, and, and sort of dominate the world with their perspective? Because that, that can be a dangerous position to take, yeah. too. And so what advice do you have for people inclined to that? Well, I actually think the the greatest change, the greatest social change comes from uh, demonstrable projects rather than announcements, speeches, and soapboxes, you know. So for me, the way I crusade, you know, in my early, early time, I worked in the New York State Education Department, and we found there were all these wonderful, wonderful projects that succeeded because we gave them a lot of federal dollars. And then when we went to replicate them, they didn't succeed because they didn't have the dollars with it. And so we went to a whole other round where we just looked for really good ideas, you know. And, and, and then we, we found, let's highlight successes, not funded successes in that sense. So I think some of it is, it's, it's the maker question, back to the one that Richard asked, you know. I think take a maker process, you know. Build something that works. Um, and if, if it works, and it works here, and it works there, and it works there, you will change things. Now, whether you get credit for it is irrelevant in that sense. But some of the educators that, I mean, one of the educators, just to, 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 my greatest educator was Dr. Richard Raber, who was my statistics professor at uh, State University of New York in Binghamton. He announced the first day you got an A or an F in the class, because he said the most dangerous grade in the world was a B plus in statistics, because you would go around thinking you understood. I got an F. I had never gotten an F. And it was devastating, okay? So I had to take it again the next semester. And there were 18 professors. Which one do you think I chose? Dr. Richard Rayberg. And I took it. And he retired from Binghamton about uh, two years ago. And I went down to Binghamton. I hadn't seen him in 15 years to thank him because I wouldn't be doing what I did if he hadn't done that, if he hadn't given me that very intense moment. But the reason that he failed me was he said, you understand the theory of statistics, you don't understand what it really means, because none of my projects were pragmatic in that sense. So I think you find and you do things that are, are real, and you make something work. Even if you can't sell it, demonstrate it, because somebody else will, either you or somebody else, will, will, will make it real. Elliot, thank you. So I'm watching our time here and realizing that we have just a minute or two, two left. So any final thoughts? Any way, anything you want to leave with uh, this group of budding entrepreneurs or in some cases uh, already effective entrepreneurs as they move into the ed space? Well, I'll sort of reiterate what you asked me in my question. A uh, couple things. Uh, think a lot about if you want to go into K-12, get on a school board. Maybe you may not be an elected board member, but get on a school advisory board. Not to be a weasel, but to actually be there. Uh, second. Second thing, look at the diversity of your team. Uh, I would argue that if you want a solution, your team ought to be diverse in every dimension of, of, of that language. Don't just have it be your sorority or fraternity friends who, who you're, you're clustering around. And I think if you're interested in my space, if you're interested in the, work, in the workforce learning space, think about learning, not just learning for employees, but think about customers. You know, the next time you buy a bicycle at Walmart, what do you want when you come home as learning assets to assemble and maximize the use of that bicycle? Uh, I often try in learning to come back to, would I use it? Would it help me? Would it, would it make a difference for me? And I think in workplace learning, we are looking for pragmatic solutions that get people to competency quickly because that time to speed is, is really a high one. But let's also make sure people will actually, Lotus Notes, when Ray Ozzie did it, was supposed to, everyone was supposed to collaborate at their desktop. It became a $300 email package, you know, and it probably took another 30 years or 25 years for us to do what we're doing today. The underlying technology existed back then, but, but it, was a, there was, it was ahead of our ability to imagine it and the affordances of that. So, uh, so go out and, and have some fun with that. And I thank you so much for uh, letting me be part of this. What a wonderful way to spend an hour in the morning. So. Thank you for doing it. And thanks for taking the time. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Elliot's getting very close to, to launching his big uh, conference every year that he does. And I know this is very tight time for you. So Elliot, thanks for joining us. Um, David, real quickly, can you give us a preview of coming attractions for next week before we sign off here? Yeah, next week our speaker is going to be David Blake, uh, formerly of Zinch, which uh, was recently acquired by Chegg, and he's now working on a new startup called Degreed. 
uh, that he'll be talking about. So he's someone who's been through this cycle once is in, and is in the thick of it again a second time. And uh, we look forward to hearing from him. And uh, again, uh, hop on the uh, on the site this week, go into the forum, and you find his name either on the right-hand column or in the Experts tab, and go into the forum through those links and uh, post your questions for Dave there, and we'll get them voted up and voted down and uh, get, get set up to have a great conversation with a, a really nice guy uh, who is really smart and hasn't done this as often as Elliot has, but is that generational difference coming up, coming up behind uh, and has some really interesting points of view. So really looking forward to talking with him. Sounds good. Sounds and remember, good. for everybody else uh, here, this video, as always, in just about uh, four minutes or so, will be posted on our YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com slash edstartup101. You'll be able to watch this for Elliot, and we'll send that link out. And uh, certainly, you're welcome to continue to engage with him on Twitter and uh, other ways as well. He's at emacy, as you've seen on the Twitter feed. Elliot, one more time, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it, and we'll uh, see you all next week. Thanks. <laughs>